Um, comes from some experiences of working down in the, the Schoharie Valley after, after the floods. It's called The Lost Tools of Schoharie. And I'd like to say it's written down, but it's really not written down, so it changes. It, 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 like Schoharie, it's changing all the time. Um, and so this time, the story goes like this. Uh, I have in my, in my shop, down in my basement, I've got, a, I've got a toolbox that I made, old pine, wooden toolbox. Uh, I, I cut a broom handle you know, to make the handle, and I've got a, a strap on it, because sometimes it's too heavy to carry, you throw the strap over your shoulder, and it's two feet long, so my framing square goes in there, and, and all the tools that, that I normally need to, to work on the car or to work out in the yard fit in there, and like, like most toolboxes, it just you know, normally sits under the workbench or off to the side in the garage or wherever. It really doesn't get a whole lot of use outside of the home. But August 28, uh, 2011, changed that for thousands of toolboxes. That's the day Hurricane Irene swept through the Schoharie Valley, and towns like Prattsville and Schoharie, Middleburg, Delanson were pretty well wiped out with six feet of water coming through town. And it was at that point that, that thousands of men and women um, grabbed their toolboxes and ran to Schoharie. And we didn't know what to put in our toolboxes. It's not like we had, you know, a certain job to do. We just went going. Because that's what you do when your neighbors and your friends and, and, and anyone is in need. You just go. And so we showed up with our toolboxes. In the first few weeks, um, our toolboxes weren't, weren't a whole lot of use because we ended up using mainly five-gallon buckets and going down and mucking out basements and carrying... Um, mud that, that, you know, 8, 12, 14 inches deep out of the basement of the Prattsville Reformed Church, you know, bucket after bucket after bucket out and all the homes that were like that. <clears throat> but then things, things began to evolve as, as a lot of the muck got out and, and we started to tear the houses apart. Um, our toolboxes began to get a, a little more use and then I noticed something unusual happening to, to my tools, I, I noticed that they, they started disappearing. The first tool that I noticed missing was a little nail punch, about this long. I carry it right in front of my, my nail pouch. And I was working with, with uh, my friend Bruce and some others at, at Moe's house. And Moe's house, like them all, had been underwater. And his back room um, had a little crawl space underneath it, and the floor had all been buckled. And so we were replacing the floor, but before we replaced the floor, um, we wanted to put insulation under it so that it would be warmer, so that it would, in some ways it would be better than it was before. Now, when you work in a place like Schoharie, you're, there's two ways to do work. You can do work really fast so you can get the job done, so you can go on to the next thing. Or you can work like, like this is the home of royalty and you take your time and you do the job right, nobody works the first way. And so Bruce and I looked at how we're gonna insulate that and we figured out the best way to do that was to, to, to take up one of the floor joists and put one of us underneath the floor all day. And there's about a foot and a half and to, to, to slide this solid insulation down, these, these two and a half foot wide by eight foot long sheets under there. And then you, you'd lie on your back and you'd nail it up like that. I won. <laughs> I, I got the short straw. <laughs> and so Bruce put me under the floor all day. And, you know, it's like, <clears throat> you know, it's like going down to the grave each time and you're crawling under there and you're putting this, this insulation up and, and you're swinging as best you can with your hammer. Um, and I, I did notice I kept losing my hat. But I'd taken, it was around Veterans Day so at the, when we were working on this, so I tied a little poppy to the my, back of my hat. And that's how I kept finding my hat. Ah, I still have still it. Have it. Um, and so, you know, and some other people showed up too. High school kids showed up, and they were eager to, eager to work. They didn't do anything. <laughs> but they were happy to be there and happy to be part of it, and it was great to have them. Anyway, so crawling up and down all day, and we finally got the floor sealed up, and it was insulated well, and Moe was just so excited about it, about it being done that way. And they were packing up, and that's when I noticed that my, my nail punch was missing. And, and I knew that it, it was down there and it would never come back. Um, uh, and that started me thinking. And then the next time I was down, uh, we were doing drywalling. 
and I brought a, a four foot long uh, drywall square for cutting drywall. And because I'm not the best at drywalling, they had me ripping things up again. But, <laughs> but we find out what our real gifts are when we're at places like Schoharie. So uh, my other two friends uh, who were with me at that, that point, Neil uh, um, and whoever, <laughs> he's a good friend. <laughs> um, we were down there working, and they were working in the other room with my drywall square, and they were, they were working, and I'm doing my thing, and, and suddenly I heard the words that I really never thought I would hear um, on, a, on a job site. And I hear my one friend say, hey, Neil, do you have any lipstick? <laughs> and Neil goes, it's cherry gloss. Is that OK? <laughs> my other buddy goes, that's my favorite. <laughs> and you know, I'm a pretty open guy. I'm, I'm open to lots of things, but that's just, I've worked on a lot of job sites. I'd never heard that before. So I, I peeked around the corner. And there were the guys with the lipstick. And they were putting it on the outlet boxes, the lipstick. And then they'd take the drywall, and they'd shove it up on the outlet box it, and stick it there and pull it off. And they would know exactly where to cut out the outlets. I thought that was great. I've, always, I've carried lipstick in my toolbox ever since. But I think I was so excited about this discovery of lipstick that when we left that day, I left my four foot square somewhere in Schoharie. Because you don't really know where you're working. You're just working on a house. Um, and that's OK, because it's a good four foot square. Um, and, um, uh, but, but working there, I also noticed you don't just lose tools. You actually gain some tools. Ah, I found ah. a hammer in my toolbox once, <laughs> randomly. No idea how it got there. But I came home with an extra hammer. And one day, I was working. And this is where we're out of the mucking stage on this one house. And I'm uh, with another pastor, and we're down, uh, and we're hanging drywall, which is kind of fun to be doing some constructive work after all the destruction, after all the ripping out and tearing out of things. It's fun to start doing some real construction. So we're hanging drywall. Um, and I'm, I'm in a house, and, and every house when you're working sort of gets a foreman. I, I don't know how it's done. I don't know if it's chosen or just sort of organically rises up out of the crew. And this guy, um, this guy Dick, was the foreman. And Dick is what I would call a, a, a serial cusser. And he would just be swearing all the time. And, and not, in a, not in a bad way or not in an in-your-face way. Just, it's just the way he talked. Cussing this and, you know, whatever. All going on. And I'm working, hanging, you know, cutting the, the drywall and trying to get it right. And we're there, you know, for, for a good part of the day. And he finally asked me, well, what is it you do? And I just turn with a sly grin on my face. And I say, well, I'm a minister. <laughs> he goes, no shit. <laughs> and, you know, and, and for the rest of the day, it was like, I can't believe you're a minister. <laughs> Which I take as, as high praise. And, you know, and, and the same thing happens that happens often when you tell people you're a minister. He just stops swearing the rest of the day. And, and, and I felt bad, because it was just kind of fun listening to him. <laughs> but he had something I'd never seen before. I, it, was, it was, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not as good as Jesus coming back, but it's close <laughs> for a minister. He had what's called a dimpler, and he yep. put it on his drill. And I'd never seen this before. And he'd take your drill, and he'd take that drywall screw, and you'd screw it into the wall, and the dimpler would keep your drill from going in too deep and popping all the way through the paper of the drywall. It was heaven. Who invented such a wondrous thing? And I raved about it all day. I raved about the dimpler. And at the end of the day, Dick said to me as we were leaving, he says, I still can't believe you're a minister. And he held out his hand to shake my hand. And I shook his hand. And in his hand was the dimpler. Oh. And it's in my toolbox to this day. I still have Dick's dimpler. And I still, you know, am amazed by that wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, and it's, it, when you're working in Schoharie, these sorts of things happen. Um, and in Schoharie, what happens along with that is at 12 noon, the Presbyterian church bell rings. And when the Presbyterian church bell rings, people stop what they're working on, hanging drywall, mucking out basements, putting down baseboard. And they leave their tools, and they all walk out into the streets, and they meander in toward the Reformed church. 
in downtown. It's like little, little streams coming together on a kinder day. And we sit and we eat. And food miraculously appears. I, I know not how, but every day there's food for all of us. And there'd be 20, 40, 60 people working, and we just show up covered in drywall dust. And here'd be, you know, these guys from IBM who are coming, taking a day off to come and work, or, or you know, my, my four masked women from Rensselaer who, who came down with their sledgehammers, or the two Mormons from Salt Lake City who came in. And it was great, sinners and saints, us all, just sitting down to eat. And it's a wonderful thing. And then when it's done, people get up and we go back to our jobs and we go back to doing what we do. Um, and that's a marvelous, a marvelous miracle that happens, happened every day last fall. Maybe it's still happening. We'll have to see. Um, and there are other wonderful things. There was a, there was a, a small parsonage in Prattsville that had been totally wiped out and this young clergy couple um, were trying to get it done and they had a they had a drywall blitz and there were there were 44 of us on a Saturday that came in and worked in this house all with our toolboxes we put them down and, and when there's 44 of you it's like ants on an anthill working around hanging drywall and you all sort of take your space and you're going and the toolboxes are sort of like common property and you don't really ask, and nobody really wonders. Tools just kind of flow back and forth um, that day, which, is, which in, its, in and of itself is quite amazing, because guys tend to be pretty protective of that sort of thing. But I remember that I was working in a space, and that, remember that hammer that I, that I found in my toolbox? I was using it to, to knock some studs out, and I placed it in the wall, and I'd gotten called into another room to work for about a half hour, and I came back, and that wall where my hammer was, it was all drywall. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it's behind Fun. there. <laughs> it's behind the drywall, that hammer. Um, uh, but the last tool that I, that I, that I want to share about is my, was my rig axe. And a, a rig axe, I framed houses in Colorado before moving here to become a camp director. And it's a 32-ounce waffle-headed framing hammer. And the back side of it looks like a hatchet, and it's great. For, for finesse work <laughs> when you're framing, to really pound something that needs to be cut down to size. Um, and that, frame, that rig axe was just wonderful for taking out aggression, for ripping down cabinets and, and uh, you know, dealing with all those questions that you don't have any answers for about, about a flood that deep in a place like Schoharie. And I remember, you know, just swinging away, working out all my theological difficulties on those cabinets. And the noon whistle, hang, we put down our tools, we left the place that we were working, and when I got back, the hammer was gone. So was all the wood that was around, because things just happen. And it's just gone. And uh, who knows where? Maybe in somebody else's toolbox by mistake. Maybe in the landfill that went. Um, but in Schoharie, everybody lost something precious. Everybody lost something that they loved. And in that valley, people are coming back and people are volunteering and working, working to rebuild a town. And something new has, has happened there, and that's a delightful thing. But I, I worry about Schoharie and Prattsville and Middleburg and Delance, and I worry that. I worry that the day will, will come when, when the, the Presbyterian church bell rings and only Presbyterians show up. I worry about the day when we sit down to eat together and we make up reasons again about why we don't like these other people. But when that day happens, when that day happens, our tools will remind us our tools will whisper up from beneath the floors or from out of the walls or from our toolboxes. And our tools will remind us about what's really important and about what, hap what really has happened in Schoharie. Ooh. The lost tools of Schoharie. <laughs>